This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. It is summertime, and we are going places, doing things, hiking, fishing, vacations, boating, and to make the fun last a little longer, we rely on our camera. We go inside outdoors with a pro photographer and an Emmy-winning videographer. And we get tips that anyone can use right there on the camera, in your pocket, on your phone. It's a popular show that we have aired before, and the time has come again for Lights, Camera, Summer Fun. Next on Kentucky Afield Radio. Skipper! 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 I don't know what you mean by Skipper. Skipper? Skipper! 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 Hey, Skipper! What? Don't skip the life jackets. Life jackets? You're right. Thanks for the reminder. Water officers everywhere remind you. Your life jackets got your back. And the backing of everyone that wants you to come home alive. So, Skipper... Don't skip the life jackets. A public service message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Oh, hi, Bill. Yeah, Father's Day. I'm sure the kids will be giving me a Maserati. That'd be nice, but no, no, I'm still thinking Maserati. You're right, I can redeem it for a hunting and fishing license. That still puts me in the fast lane for fun this summer. Load, buy, print online. Well, that's a plus. I'll have them put the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife gift certificate on the list, too. Right after Maserati. Find it at fw.ky.gov. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. I have a couple of guests in the studio today who are masters at their trade. To my left is Brian Volland. He is an Emmy-winning videographer for the Kentucky Field TV show. Also, an expert in wildlife photography is Dr. John Brunges. And you have seen John's work in the Kentucky Field calendar and Kentucky Field magazine. We're going to talk about something today that we all do practically routinely these days. Take pictures or take videos. And with the help of these two gentlemen, we'll know a little bit more about how to do it better. It's amazing what technology has done today. Everybody you see has a camera with them. Not only do they have a camera, they have a probably a high definition video camera in their pocket. And they use them on vacations. They'll use them in weird places like at the electronic store and take a picture. This is what I want to buy next time. They'll take it home and Google it. They take pictures of price codes and uh, you name it. It's not just people, places and things anymore. I don't know really where to start, photos, videos. I'll just start with photos. Uh, John, when you look through, let's just say Facebook, at people's photos, do you notice a trend of a style of photo that is taken? And maybe if they had done this, it may have been even better. I would say the biggest thing that I see is that people don't get close enough. The lens on an iPhone or a other smartphone is a pretty wide-angle lens, and so they'll be... Unless you get up close and personal, the the image, a lot of times you can't see really what the person was trying to convey. So I think you, a lot of cases, get a better photo if you get almost in that range where you're uncomfortable, where you're uncomfortably in their space and up close and personal, because that way you can actually see what you're trying to take a picture of. You can pinch these screens these days. I don't know if you can do that, though, with while you're shooting video. Brian, do you have a clue? Yeah, a lot of times you can. Now, uh, for example, on the iPhone, uh, and, and I would imagine the, the Droid is the same way, if you pinch the zoom, you're doing a digital zoom. So it, it's almost the, to the same effect as blowing your pictures up in your editing software in post. So you're losing some of the original uh, resolution and clarity of the image if you do that. I agree with John. Get as close as you can and that way you maintain the best image possible. And another thing is, is, is headroom. It's, so many people want to just point the camera at someone's face, and they forget that there's, you know, they, they may show three feet of nothingness above their head. <laughs> uh, I, a lot of times I try and I think a better way to approach it is maybe point it at their chest or, or even at their belt and, you know, cut that headroom out of your photos. If you are doing... Video, or if you're doing photographs and you're using a smartphone, or you're using a pocket point and shoot, or a nice uh, digital SLR single lens reflex camera, no matter what you spend, 
I want to get this statement out of you, John, that you said earlier. What is the best camera to have? A photo- professional photographer. He calls the best camera this the camera that you have with you. And I have seen some of your work on Facebook to where, obviously, an iPhone was the camera you had with you. And, and it, it is. It, and it gives you an immediate gratification. The image quality is nowhere near the same level. I mean, you know, if I'm taking pictures that I care about the image quality, the iPhone is, or the, any smartphone is not the same. But you have that instant gratification. You have the ability to take the picture. I think back to my childhood. I, I don't have any pictures of, you know, going through high school and going through. You know, I was a photographer for yearbook and took pictures of it, but. Yeah, you know, I don't have pictures of me and my friends, and I'm I'm jealous of young folks today that have that phone and have the ability to take the pictures of them and their friends. And it's not the best picture in the world, but it, you have something, and you'll always have that picture. We're going to bounce back and forth between photographs and video because I'm going to assume that a lot of people themselves will will bounce back and forth between whatever. Let's say you are at a birthday party, you take some photographs. You take a little video. Brian, you are an Emmy-winning videographer and producer, and we see your work every weekend on KET in Kentucky Field. And plus, you do this on the side, plus you have children. Is there a trick? I don't know if it's a trick. I I think it's just more of getting used to having a camera around you all the time. Uh, So so typically, you know, for any event, of course, I always have a smartphone in my pocket so I can get video or photos at any time. A lot of times, if it's a a special event, I'll go ahead and have my bigger stills camera, which also shoots video, and I'm not shy about flipping back and forth. I'll shoot a few stills, and then I'll go over straight into video mode and start recording video. But I've also familiarized myself with the camera enough that, you know, I'm comfortable switching between the two. And I think that, you know, if you're willing to learn how both modes work, then you can get in there and, and do both somewhat simultaneously what are the popular cameras that people are like to have with them for video these days and the term handy cam comes to mind personally i shoot on a, on dslr cameras i shoot both uh, video and still photos on those cameras i think you see a lot of people moving that route because you have a camera that can take fantastic stills and pretty good video as well nowadays you can get any handy cam for 150 bucks on up that will shoot decent HD video. They shoot decent HD video if the person behind the camera knows what they're doing. Or is it automatic? Can you press the auto button and it still be pretty good? Well, the auto button it definitely comes down to who's shooting the video. Um, you know, there there are a couple of basic rules if you follow that's really going to help you out a lot. And, you know, if you can get stable, if you can use a tripod or at the very least brace your arms against your body or lean against the wall, that's go- going to go a long way into helping your video look, look good. Not like you're just on a, you know, a wild roller coaster ride uh, all the time. That's first and foremost, get as stable as, as possible. Uh, you want light. If you can be outside, you're going to be much better off than trying to shoot a birthday party at 9 o'clock inside with, you know, maybe one uh, lamp in the corner. So get as much light as possible. Get as stable as you can. A friend of mine likes to snow ski. Bought himself a new toy. It's a helmet cam. And I guess kids can put these on their helmets. They ride bikes, go skateboarding or rollerblading, what have you. I don't have one. I feel like I'm at a loss. You should get one. Do you have one? Uh, I got one, and uh, I've, I've had some fun with it so far. It's it's neat. We go whitewater canoeing, and you can strap it on the boat and you know, video what you're doing. Or there is all kinds of... actually have got a little uh, remote-controlled helicopter now that I strap the camera to the bottom of and can take aerial photographs with with this with this camera. That has to be 20 kinds of fun. So they're waterproof, splash-proof. Waterproof, bang-proof, you know. I guess you guys in the, in the TV show use one occasionally. Yeah, we use them on Kentucky Field TV, and I love these little cameras. The, the image quality now are, are great on them. You, you can't destroy them. You can put them anywhere. You can you can uh, shoot half the day above water, half the day underwater. You don't have to have any kind of special tools to go from one to the other. They are fantastic little cameras, and, and I shoot with them all the time now. 
People today have so much access to other people's photos and videos via Facebook that we didn't have, I don't know, just a matter of a few years ago, a generation ago, it wasn't there at all. Uh, You just didn't see. I guess maybe you would be emailed some photos, or if you were at someone's house, let me show you some pictures I took. And a lot of people are fairly good at taking pictures of what they want to shoot. It's good, however, to know your personal limits and the limits of your camera equipment. We'll talk more about that coming up in our next segment. My name is Charlie Baglin, and you are listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, talking about taking better video and photographs today with two people who really know their stuff in the business. One is Brian Ball, and he works with the Kentucky Afield TV show. You see it on KET on weekends. He's an Emmy winner. Also, Dr. John Brunges, who many say wrote the book on wildlife photography. You've seen his work in the Kentucky Afield calendar. And for the lack of a better term, I'm going to just call this 21st century the age of documentation, meaning we can take a photograph or a video of practically anything because we have a high-definition video camera and 7, 8, 9 megapixel camera right in our pocket. And like you said a while ago, John, the best camera is the one you have with you. But you kind of need to know what you can and can't do with it. On an Eagle Watch weekend once, I saw someone with a point-and-shoot take photographs of eagles in treetops. That's well and good, but when you get back in and take a look and you have to really enlarge it on your computer screen to see what it is, it's sort of a blurry, pixelated mess. And you just have to trust that, yes, that really is an eagle in the treetop. And that's the point I wanted to make. You can't always get the shot you want. And sometimes it's better to simply go home and describe what you saw vividly, and let the people see it in their own imagination. Equipment makes all the difference in the world. Wildlife photography is hard. and You have to have big lenses and or at least be really willing to work to be in a place where you can get up close and personal. A lot of times with your iPhone or your other smartphone, if you're close enough to take a good wildlife picture, you could be in trouble because the critter could really not like the idea that you're that close to them. If you want to be a wildlife photographer, you're not going to do it with a smartphone or with a point-and-shoot or something like that. You, It's going to be expensive. What would you think would be the limit to a smartphone camera? They take nice landscape pictures. You can get a scenic picture. You can take plants and things like that that you can get up close to. You can, you know, again, take pictures of people in, in, the, in a surrounding landscape or good pictures of people. Uh, but if you're looking, again, for a, taking picture of the bald eagle in the top of the tree, the bald eagle in the top of the tree, I don't care what equipment you have, is a nearly impossible photograph because it's so far away. Even with the biggest lenses and whatever, you know, you usually end up with a dot up in the top of the tree. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. So, again, look at what you, you – the beautiful thing about the you know your smartphone or any other is – You take your picture and you get instant gratification. You see it right there and you say, "Mm, that's not what I wanted. Change things up a little bit and shoot it again and shoot it again. I mean, I do that all the time. I'll have five or six pictures of the same thing. Like, okay, this is the the image that I wanted. And delete, delete, delete on the others and keep going. That's a pretty good place to transition to the next subject is knowing what to delete. Digital cameras give you the luxury of making mistakes. They give you the benefit of snapping the picture, seeing exactly what it looks like. If you don't like it, try it again. Or take a dozen pictures of something, take 50, and then go through and pick out the very best ones. Time-consuming, but unless you're taking a photograph of blowing out the candles on a cake where it happens once and that's it, you don't always get the photo you want on the first try. So you wind up with a ton of pictures you either need to delete or download to someplace safe your hard drive, or burn them to a CD. And quite frankly, that's the part of taking home movies and photographs that's easy to forget, or your memory card is going to be filled, and you can't take any more shots. Yeah, you know, it's it's something I struggle with, and really everybody has to deal with now in in this digital age of video and and photos. Uh, You have to do what we call data wrangling. You have to do something with all these photographs that you take. Uh, in the past, I've been guilty of taking three, four hundred p- 
pictures at an event. And I've finally come to realize that it's it's not how many pictures you take, it's a few quality pictures that matter. So I've just stopped taking photo after photo after photo. Instead, I spend my time trying to take a couple of quality photos so I don't have to go through all the junk just to pull out a couple of lucky shots. How does that apply to shooting video? Do you shoot way more minutes than you really need to and go back and and cut off what you need? I really tried to discipline myself on it, and I started a few years ago, is to really shoot only what I need to shoot. Uh, For Kentucky Field, I'll, I'll be out, say, in a boat for six or eight hours. Well, I don't shoot for six or eight hours. My goal is to come back with maybe a solid 40 minutes worth of stuff or less it's a lot less to go through in the end and if you really take that time and and focus on getting the proper shots getting the shots that tell the story of whatever event that you're at or whatever birthday or, or vacation you're on if you take the time to take the photo that tells the story then you don't need just 300 pictures of junk and maybe some lucky shots and you say you'll go out with a video camera all day, shoot 40 minutes of footage for what will end up being a six or seven minute piece. Now, people at home probably don't do video editing. They're not TV producers. But are, is there good software you can get for cheap, or is there a free download that will let you maybe string some chunks of footage together and make a little home movie? Yeah, I, I think whether you're a Windows or a Mac user, there there are free softwares that you can find. I, I know Mac has a, a has an iMovie video editor, which is a great program for anybody who wants to edit their videos sh- either shot on a smartphone or a or a handy cam camera. Uh, I, I know Windows also has some free video software available. There's there's some that cost a few bucks that also work great as well. I think the key is if you're going to shoot video, do something with it. Don't just shoot it and let it sit on your phone or your hard drive and never use again because then you wasted your time, you, you you took yourself out of the moment to shoot video just to do nothing with it. I always edit everything I shoot just as a justification for not wasting my time shooting it. John, let me ask you kind of the same question. Going back and doing any post work to your photographs, if that's cropping or reducing red eye, is that something that you would recommend to the everyday photographer i guess it depends on the picture and your needs and those kind of things i a little bit like brian said try to shoot the best picture you can in the beginning and have the least amount of editing hopefully hopefully most images you you don't have to do any editing to the best images you have are not the ones that you have a major tweak on they're the ones that came at right straight out of the camera that way there might be a little bit of minor tweak but uh, I, you know, in general, my best images aren't tweaked much at all. If you use an iPhone, a Droid, a pocket camera, or the fancy pro stuff like you guys use, photographs and videos have three things in common. Composition, you know, what are you filling the frame with? Does it make sense? Two is focus. That's pretty simple. Three is proper lighting. Composition, focus, exposure. And all you have to do is tap the screen. If if I were looking at a picture of you two, I could tap on either of your spaces, and it would be in focus. I could tap on the wall behind you, and that would become in focus. Tap around on the screen, see what really looks good before you hit the shutter button. Yeah, but don't spend too long tapping around the screen, otherwise your subject may be tapping their feet, trying to wait for you to take the photo, because I've had that happen to me several times. <laughs> That's right. You can fool around and miss the shot. The one thing about the cameras that people have in their pocket, there are two nifty features that I just absolutely love, and I wish that I could see more of this from the photographs of my friends on Facebook, but I really am not seeing it. One is called HDR. It's in the options menu probably of most uh, smartphone cameras. High dynamic range, is it, John? That's correct. Now, that means that every part of the picture is properly exposed, as I understand it. Everybody's taken a picture where the person in the foreground is properly exposed and then the sky in the background is whited out Mm -hmm. because it's too bright. Or reverse, the background is right and the person in the foreground is too dark. It's because there's a dynamic range of light. A sensor can only record a certain segment of the amount of light out there. 
So by using the HDR option, it's like your camera takes three different photographs at once, all different exposures, and then stitches the best parts of it together so your whole picture looks great. So if you're taking a picture of somebody at a sunset, the sky behind them is orange, mm -hmm. and they themselves are properly exposed instead of being a, a, a silhouette. In theory, if it's done correctly, yes. But HDR is something to look for on your pocket camera. See if it's there. Another thing is the... The panoramic mode. The panoramic mode, which is just as cool as they come. I have used this. I was at an archery tournament recently. And you could pan around the room and turn that in, just like that commercial with the kids sitting in their little bug uh, costumes. That's exactly what it does. And it's just as slick and as seamless as anything I'd ever seen. And when I look for photographs, especially vacation photographs from friends, I'm looking for what's different. Show me something from a unique perspective that maybe I just didn't consider looking for before. Do you, and you use that too, don't you, John? I use the panoramic all the time. We're talking with Emmy-winning videographer Brian Ballen from the Kentucky Field TV show Weekends on KET and standout wildlife photographer and wildlife biologist Dr. John Brunges. We're getting their tips on how to take better video and better photographs, often with a camera phone. Still to come, we'll talk about those people who do not want their picture taken. Camera shy. My name's Charlie Baglin. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. The subject this hour is videography and photography. If you consider yourself an amateur or a professional, you will appreciate the advice my guests have to give. First up, our fishing report. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. We're talking this hour on video and photography. Our guests are pros in the wildlife arena, and they say compared to some people, wildlife is much easier. More after the break. What's wrong? I caught my wife in a lie. That's bad. We're fishing, right? Yeah. She catches a catfish, four-pounder, claims it was a seven, snaps a picture, sends it to all her friends. And they bought it? Yeah. People believe her. <laughs> you taught her well. Indeed I did. Your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, fishing's not about math. It's about fun. And fudge it a little if you need to. Kentucky fishing. Be honest. It'll make a liar out of you. Kentucky Field Radio, this is Charlie Baglin. We're talking videography and photography today, talking to Dr. John Brunges, who is a stellar wildlife photographer. You really should see his work. John Brunges, B-R-U-N-J-E-S dot com. And Brian Vollen, who is a videographer, Emmy Award winning with the Kentucky Field Television Show. And you see that on KET on Saturday nights. In this segment, we want to focus on working with people. Some people hate to have their photograph taken. Others just simply will not put the camera down. We all have smartphones in our pocket. They all have high-definition cameras on them. And I saw Apple come across with a statistic that the iPhone is the most used camera on the planet. I tend to agree with it. You have a smartphone in your pocket. It has all the gizmos on it. That's the camera you are going to use. Before we sat down to do the show, I sat down to my Facebook page and looked at some of the random photos of my Facebook friends. I wanted to see if there was a trend emerging, such as are they of scenery or are they of people? Are they overexposed? Are they underexposed? How well are they composed? More times than not, a group of people, maybe two, three, or four people, standing in front of something. That's it, standing in front of something. It may be looking straight at the camera. It may be a, a welcome to the smoky sign, welcome to Myrtle Beach sign. And that is a requisite shot. I'll give you that. But is there any escape from it? Is there any alternative to it? I'm looking at either one of you. Well, I think it's always better to show people doing things. First of all, I think the the reason you see that photo a lot is traditionally we've all grown up seeing that photo of Grandma and Grandpa and everybody else standing in front of the sign or, or the building or wherever you are. And so we're so conditioned to take that photo. And that's fine. But then uh, say you're at the... You know, you're in Gatlinburg at the cotton candy factory. Take a picture of somebody actually making cotton candy or pulling taffy or, or doing what you're there to do. 
not just standing outside of the sign. Or eating the cotton candy? Yeah, or, you know, participating in the location of what you're at. The other thing I might say is change the position of the camera. Everybody loves to take you're standing up and they're standing up and it's eye level to eye level kind of shot. Get lower with the camera. Get above with the camera. Shoot from some unusual direction, which a lot of times will give you a shot that looks a little bit different yeah. than what every other picture looks like. Again, like I said earlier, get way too close for comfort and get the you know, kind of a unique perspective by being up and close and personal. And that's so important with, uh, say, kids and, and pets. Get down to their level. I, I can't tell you how many tops of heads of my friends' kids that I've seen. If, if the parents or, or you would just get down on your hands and knees and take pictures at their level, it brings so much more of the child's personality out. You can really see what the family dog looks like instead of just looking at the top of their head. That's good advice. So that's what the photographer can do about the people actually in the photograph, do they have to look at the lens? I would say no. In fact, a lot of times when I take pictures, like I said before, I, I don't try to just shoot the entire time I'm at an event. I try and pull out the camera, take a couple of candids, and get back in it because I want to be on vacation too. I don't want to take pictures the entire time. Not that I don't love taking pictures, but I want to play and have fun with my family as well. So, you know, I look for those opportunities where people are doing things. I take a couple of pictures of everyone participating at the event and then move on. I don't make everybody pose everywhere we're at. You were talking about the angle of the camera. That's something that's done also with video. You put that camera down there on the ground. You get the blades of the grass in the shot, and you're looking up at something. Show me it from a perspective I've never seen before. That's what's going to hold my attention, Brian. A absolutely. So, you know, your kid's uh, skateboarding in the driveway. How easy is it to just point the camera at them for 30 seconds, you have them skateboarding, and you're done? Well, that's fine, but I would challenge you, take a minute instead, get a, get a wide shot of them on their skateboard, get up close, put the camera down on the ground, get their wheels going by, hold the camera pointing at their feet, then shoot a shot of... Uh, just their face and, and just en enjoying it. And, and you can shoot five, six, seven shots of video in just a little bit more than the time it would take you to just sit on the porch and shoot at one wide shot. Put them all together in video editing software, and you have something much more compelling for people to watch than just a wide shot of your kid on a skateboard. We set out with the piece talking about taking pictures with people probably is the subject matter. Some people don't like to have their photos taken. They are camera shy from the word go. John, are you one of them? I don't like to have my... That's why I have a camera, so I don't have to be in the picture. Have you ever tried to get past that? I mean, yes. I mean, there. I mean, certainly there are pictures of me, but I would rather take pictures of others than have my own picture taken. And every now and then, you meet somebody like you that just doesn't want to have their picture taken. I mean, you pull out the camera, you might as well be pulling out a gun, and they're saying, no, 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 don't shoot. Why they have this phobia, I will never know. To me, it just sounds a little silly. And one thing I've come to believe about camera-shy people is that they don't know how to pose. You know, it's not hard. This isn't for a magazine. It's a snapshot, for heaven's sake. We've all seen this. I had a friend in Florida who, every time you took her picture, she was pointing at something else in the picture. If she were standing by an airplane, you'd, she'd be pointing at the airplane, just in case you might miss it. Don't do that. I, that, I guess, is how our personalities come through. Is there a way that you two have had to work around that? Yeah, it's something that I deal with a lot of times um, in wedding photography. Uh, you you have the whole range of people who want to have their picture taken all the way down to just, I don't want to be in a picture at all. I, I You know, I hate the way I look in a picture. What I call it a lot of times is, is sniping people off. I, I prefer to, to put a long lens on. And if I want to get a shot of somebody, I'll I'll set up and I'll wait for them to have a, a reaction to something, a, a laugh, a, um, you know, a, a certain look, and I'll stand at a distance and, and get their photo that way. And then you get them in the, relaxed in their natural environment and not uptight about having a camera in their face. John, any advice? I, I, I'm, I'm totally along the same line. I'll, I'll put a 300 millimeter on there and... We, I shoot I shoot a lot of pictures of our biologists when we're in the field working, and none of them like the idea of you taking their picture. And a lot of times after it's all over with, they're like, when did you take that picture? How did you take that picture? 
and you get that telephoto and you reach out and you're able to grab the image and people don't know. And I think you get less artificial expressions and things because people are being natural and they don't realize that their pictures are being made. There is another reflex that people in a picture always tend to exhibit, and that's the expectation that in a photograph they have to lean in, just as if they are not going to be in the frame if they don't. That's one of my pet peeves, and if I'm taking that picture, I'll say, you don't have to lean in, just stand there, just sit there naturally. And it turns out to be a better picture. And two, they automatically believe they have to smile. Sometimes people are sad, they're angry, they're in a state of disbelief or shock. and That's the emotion of the moment. That's what you need to capture. If everybody is always smiling, hey, that's great, but that's just not the reality of life itself. And that's what great photographs will capture. The one, one exception to that is anytime somebody's in a costume, it's like they instantly become, please take my picture. It is amazing how that you, you can do whatever. People will just turn in a costume. They'll become, you know, please take my picture, whatever. They'll we'll pose for whatever you want. A same person in regular every day wouldn't let you take their picture, put a costume on them, and they, they're, they're ready. That is an interesting observation. Do you find that true? The same with with what you do, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. If And to piggyback on the costumes, or, or people who are at an event who already expect to have their picture taken. Like I said, a lot of times at weddings, people know they're going to get their pictures taken, and, and they're they're okay with it. They're, they're ready for it. I have a friend out in the Southwest who I have not seen since sometime in the 1980s. And from what I remember of her, she was a very pretty girl. Have not seen, but the last time I saw her, I had my camera, and I said, let me get a picture. Let's get somebody to take a picture of us. Oh, no, no, I can't do that. Consequently, I I do not have a picture of my friend. I dare say many of her friends, family, grandchildren don't either, and I'm wondering, they're the ones being cheated. But if she were on her horse and barrel racing, photos of her doing that in her element, doing what she is good at and proud of, Those are more than welcome. That's probably a better picture anyway when you're not posing and you're not looking at the camera. You don't have to smile and say cheese. Right. And sometimes there's nothing more annoying than somebody with a camera that will not stop taking photos. Right. At some point, you have to just take a few photos or take a little bit of video and then put the camera away and enjoy your family and friends Be able to put that camera away and enjoy the event or activity you're participating in. Does that describe you, John? Can you put it down? Sometimes I'm taking pictures, and that's what I do. But there are other times that I I don't want the camera. If I'm out with my friends and, you know, going to a concert or going to whatever, I don't need or want the camera there. My girlfriend has the most beautiful senior in high school picture I've ever seen. Let me describe it to you. She was not... Looking at the camera, for one, she was sort of turned sideways, almost profile. And in fact, the photographer could have taken it by accident. As far as I know, he may have shot a few of the standard pose. But this one of her not even looking at the camera, but looking away, looking up, stunning. And that same type of approach, I think, could be done with practically anybody anywhere. To think that the best picture is of someone smiling and looking at a camera... It's not true at all. Comment, Brian. Sure. Those are called candid photos. And a lot of times, candids are some of the most powerful photos and the most interesting to look at because they're they're different than just the standard, say, cheese photos. And your your group photos, could be they could be looking up at you know, the Statue of Liberty. They don't have to always be looking at the camera. And I, I've been hitting on this point a lot that if you do something different, you're going to have a variety of different photos. When you get home, you'll be pleased to email these to your friends. You will be pleased to actually frame them and hang them on the wall. You will be pleased to post these on Facebook and see just how many likes you will get. The likes on Facebook rarely equate to what you think is the best photograph. Uh, the, my favorite photographs ever get a few likes, and the ones that I'm like, eh, whatever, get tons of likes. You can't, your photographs have to please you. That's the most important thing. We're getting some practical advice on photography and videography today. Brian Vollen from Kentucky Field and 
wildlife photographer John Brunges are my guests. We have a few more minutes. My name is Charlie Baglin, so stay with us. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. Kentucky Afield Radio, this is Charlie Baglin. Welcome back. Talking to a couple of camera pros today about how to take better pictures and better videography with often not much more than your smartphone. We've talked about people who are camera shy. The photographer, Brian, brought up that will not put the camera down. And there is also that third category of people that has to be the class clown, the comedian that puts the bunny ears behind whoever he's standing next to in the shot, always has to do the the goofy face. And in years down the road, you'll say, oh, wasn't he funny? No, he's sort of being a, a goofus. Brian, any magic answers? Okay, I'll, I'll appease him. I'll, uh, if somebody's doing bunny ears, fine. I'll take that photo, and then I'll say, "All right, now you know one serious one for yeah. the family album." Or with digital, you can take as many pictures as you want anymore. So uh, I'll appease him to some extent, and then try and get the original image that I was hoping to take. Next question, gentlemen, is one that always has intrigued me: What are you allowed to take pictures of, or what are you not allowed to take pictures of? The rule of thumb that I have always used is people in public places doing public things are a fair game to be photographed. If you can see it, you can shoot it. Better put, if anyone else can see it, you can take a picture of it. Unless there's an old photography sign posted, and we've seen those. Border crossings, military institutions, and one other. Does the subject of the photo have an expectation of privacy? It doesn't matter who they are. It could be Tim Farmer from the TV show. If he's sitting at a restaurant, he's in public, take his picture. But if he turns his back to send a text message, take an aspirin, if he has gone through the motions to seek a moment of privacy, then grant that. Discretion should definitely be used. You know, as, as you said, if somebody's trying to step to the side, if somebody, you know, maybe has children that... There's no real good reason for you to be taking somebody's picture without at least asking them first if it's okay. Then maybe you shouldn't take that image without at least asking permission from whomever's going to be in the picture. John? I tend to be gravitated towards unusual things. And uh, a few years ago, I was photographing the bicycle race, and a guy came by in the shiniest red polyester suit with gold stripes on it. And it was a picture that I had to take. But I was able to take it without his face or without, you know, identifying him in that photograph. And so that, you know, that was a case where I didn't have a problem with taking his picture. We're sort of rattling through a few last questions before we close the show. We've all heard the term, I want to show this in the best light. What is the best light in which to take a picture? Morning and evening light is, to me, some of the most beautiful and the most photographers some of the most beautiful light. It's going passing through a larger chunk of the atmosphere, and it, it compresses the wavelength and makes everything pop. You've seen been out where everything glows kind of in the morning or evening, and it's really, really pretty light. But you know, the best time to take a picture is when the, when the image is in front of you, and what you want to capture is in front of you. But you just have to remember that there's certain, if you're taking a picture of the family at the beach, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to have some really harsh shadows. I was taught a cloudy day is the best for video because you have sort of this lampshade over the sky, and it gives this uniform lighting. Yes, it, I, I definitely prefer a cloudy day typically when, when shooting video because where shooting video differs from photography a lot of times, you have the option of moving everyone around to take advantage of the best light if you're doing pose photography. So if we have a cloudy day, it diffuses the light of the sun, it really eliminates a lot of shadows, and then everyone's evenly lit from every angle. And it, it just makes my job a lot easier. Uh, Better ways to improve your photography wherever you happen to be, if that's a hunting trip, a fishing trip, family vacation, can that be done as simply by changing the background? How important is background? I think it's, it can be huge. You know, you can have times where you want a very simple and plain background where because you want the the person to be your focus you want that you may have times where you have a little bit more going on in the background so that you have uh that you have more interest one of the beautiful things about a DLSR is you have the ability to 
control the aperture. You can set it up that you can really have very little depth of field, so it's just your subject in focus and it pulls them out. Or you can have something with a lot of depth of field so that you have your person, your background, all that. But look at your, I always, you know, the big thing, and I do it, we all do it probably, but after the fact, you look at your picture and you're like, wow, there's a tree growing out of that person's head. Or there's a, you know, a statue behind them or a power pole or something. Look at, really look at what your background is and think about how is this going to look with the person, you know, in the picture. You'll see there's a big power pole in the middle of what you're trying to do or you know, that you've got something that's really annoying in the background. And so I'll either move the picture or not shoot it at all. Another question. Somebody shoots a video and... Is it possible to get a quality photograph printed from one frame of video? Because you see these pictures, how in the world did they get that shot? And my bet is they were rolling video and they just happened to stop it on that frame. Yeah, if you put a photograph and a still image taken from video side by side, you'll definitely be able to tell a difference. But if that still image from the video is the only thing you have and, uh, and you want to be able to frame it, then it may work in a pinch. How many megapixels do you need to take a quality picture that you may blow up to be an 8x10? Five? five? Four. Four? Five, four? Yeah, for any camera out there today, it'll, it'll be just fine at 8x10. Somebody told me a good photographer will never let you see their bad work. You're going to take bad pictures. Don't take the picture that you know is going to be a waste. Well, having something bad is not worth having. Wait for that shot. Wait for that good shot. Uh, and, and, and get the best possible shot and don't have a ton of waste. But everybody's got bad pictures. I mean, again, on any given day, I'll have far more bad pictures than, than pictures that are good. Last question to either one of you, text and drive. John, to you? No. How about you, Brian? No, no more texting and driving. No more texting and driving. So you used to. Well, I, I may have done it in the past, but no, it's just not worth it anymore. Uh, not anymore. This has been a very good show. I want you to see these fellows work. Again, Brian Volland, an Emmy-winning videographer, producer with the Kentucky Field TV show. It's on Saturday nights on KET. And John Brunges, you've probably seen his work in Kentucky Field magazine and the calendar, but you can also go to his website. That is johnbrunges, B-R-U-N-J-E-S, dot com. I'm a hobbyist myself, but I learn a lot every time I talk to you all. We are out of time. Come back again in a week. My name is Charlie Baglin, and we will go inside outdoors again right here on Kentucky Afield Radio.